We're in this teaching series called Grit. You guys like this series so far? Hey, how great was Andrew's message last week? My gosh. I was so inspired listening to him and, and watching that video and just being reminded that that's what we're called to do. We're called to reach lost people, and it's going to take some grit to do that. Amen? Um, if you've been around church, you've heard of this thing called the Great Commission. If you haven't, it's the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended back up into heaven. He, he died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was put in the grave. On the third day, he came up out of the grave, spent 40 days walking and talking, appeared to over 500 eyewitnesses, and then he went back up into heaven, and right before he did, he said, hey, guys, don't forget your calling. Don't forget the mission. Those of you who have already found life change through me, I want, you to, I want you to focus on turning around and sharing that with somebody else. Go love somebody, go serve somebody, go build up and edify believers, make disciples so they can get fired up and full of faith and turn around and reach more lost people. He said, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, don't you ever forget, I'm going with you every single step of the way. That's our calling, church, right? That's what we've been talking about in this series. However, what we all know is there are times when life gets really difficult, right? Life gets hard, life gets painful, it gets confusing, it gets frustrating. And, and isn't it true that we find ourselves in these seasons where it's like, I, I, know, I know that's my calling, but I'm really struggling right now. And, and not only is my calling a little bit intimidating to begin with, but now that I'm really struggling and I'm really hurting and I'm really going through some stuff, like, isn't it true that we go, yeah, I know that calling's out there. I just can't mess with that right now. I'm really struggling right now. I'll get to that sometime later, right? And, and, but here's the thing. Those two things, they're not supposed to happen independently. Watch this. Jesus said this. In this world, you will have trouble. We know that. He said, but take heart. I've overcome the world. He said, but, but understand this. Even though in this world you will have trouble, don't ever forget this promise. The thief comes only to steal and, steal and kill and destroy. That's why there's trouble. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. These things happen at the same time. They're not independent, right? Jesus knows if the only time we experience life to the fullest is when we don't have troubles, we won't experience much life to the fullest, right? I mean, When's the last year that you've lived where you haven't had any troubles? If the only time we live life to the fullest is when we don't have any troubles, we, we are in trouble, right? And it's the same Jesus who also said, I got a calling for you. I got a mission for you. So understand these three things he says, they all go together. When you live walking in your calling, you can have life to the fullest even when you're in the middle of difficulties, even when you're having troubles. I gave you a mission. That mission will help you live life to the fullest, even in the middle of difficulties. But that's gonna take some grit. That's what this series is about, all right? So with that in mind, and I told you a couple weeks ago, one of the, one of the, the big things on my mind lately is, man, I, I wanna do that. I wanna live really well, and I wanna walk in my God-given calling, even when life gets difficult. So I've been reading the book of Philippians just nonstop, over and over and over, and before you go, wow, he's spiritual, it's four chapters. I'm not that spiritual, all right? But I've been reading this book over and over, and I've been reading it because it's, 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 it's written by Paul, and as we're gonna see today, this guy has figured out how to do what we just talked about. He understands he has a calling, that calling includes reaching people, but he's going through some really tough times and he's experiencing life to the fullest at the same time. And as we're gonna, as we're gonna see today, he's, he's in a really difficult situation when he writes the book of Philippians, but he's living at that time in difficulties with joy and confidence and purpose. That's what I want. That's what you want. We wanna have joy and confidence and purpose on the good days and on the bad days, right? So what is it that he did that we can do? What is it that he learned that we need to learn? Because we want to experience what he's experiencing. So that's the goal of today. Before I read some, uh, a chunk of Philippians for you, um, I wanna set this up. Um, if you haven't been here, I wanna remind you some of the things that this guy has been through so that you can start to understand. Wait a second. When he talks about, I understand what it's like to live with difficulties, he means what he says. 
which means, because here's what we do. We, we read the Bible sometimes and go, yeah, that's great for them, but they don't know what I've been through. They don't know what I'm going through. No. Understand, Paul understands pain, all right? Th this is just a list of some of the things. Go ahead and put those up. It's just some of the things he's been through. He's been thrown in prison several times, not for stealing or domestic violence or hurting somebody, for trying to help people experience life through Jesus. He's been thrown in prison multiple times, flogged close to death. I don't want you to just see a list, go ahead and leave it up, but I want you to, I want you to see it in your mind. When someone would, would get flogged in this day and age, they, they, would, they would be whipped with this whip that has these long leather straps with pieces of, of bone and metal in the, in the leather straps. And so every time a whip would hit one of the people getting flogged, it would stick to them, and those little chunks of leather I mean, of, of, of bone and, and metal would literally pull flesh off of the body every time they pull the whip back. So when you get flogged, it's a near-death experience and your body is completely marred. I want you to understand the guy that we're about to read today is writing with a whole lot of scars. His body has been brutally battered. Whipped 40 times, five different times. Beaten with rods, stoned, not Colorado stoned. I don't know where you're watching this from, but I gotta make that clear around here. <laughs> this is pelted with, with boulders and rocks until you almost die. Three shipwrecks, abandoned in the open sea, life was threatened multiple times, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst. That's just to name some of them. This guy understands extreme pain. So I want you to feel that because sometimes, sometimes when somebody tries to give us advice, we think you don't have a clue what I'm, what I'm going through, so shut up. Right? I want you to know this guy knows. He knows pain. He knows confusion. He knows frustration. He knows, God, where are you and why are you letting this happen to me? He knows those feelings, all right? He knows. And when he, when he writes Philippians, understand that he's now been arrested again and he's been put in a Roman prison. They call it house arrest. Um, don't picture a nice house. Picture like a one, one bedroom sized cave. He's in this prison chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. We don't know if he was chained by the feet, chained by the wrists, but I picture him, one arm is chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, in prison, can't leave, stuck, knowing that he might be executed at any minute, any day. He's a church starter. He's on fire for Jesus. His whole mission in life is I wanna be out there starting churches, praying with people, hugging people, loving people, telling them about Jesus, like that's his life mission. He's a type A go-getter, and he's stuck in a prison wrongfully, put in prison, chained to a Roman guard a million miles from his dreams, okay? That's the situation. That guy writes this letter to a church in Philippi that we now call Philippians. And theologians have studied this book forever, right? And they say there's one word that describes the book of Philippians, joy. That's crazy. His body is scarred and marred everywhere. He's stuck in life, chained to a, Roman guard, could die at any moment, and he writes a letter about joy. I wanna know what he knows, <laughs> amen? I wanna know what this guy knows. I wanted to read the whole book to you. That's what I really wanted to do today, um, all four chapters, but I know that some of you would, would, I know some of you are watching this on a boat. I have some friends that watch this, these services on a boat, and I know that they would close the laptop and start wakeboarding as soon as I got to chapter two. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'm gonna read 14 verses, but I want you to get a picture of this guy's vibe. I want you to feel it. I want you to understand everything he's gone through, and yet this is his mental state. Ready? Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm writing this letter, it doesn't start like that. My letter starts with, dear God, you ought to see what I've been through. You have no idea what they've been doing to me. You have no idea how bad this is. Please help, please pray. Please devise a plan to get me out. Not Paul. He says, I just want you to know that grace and peace is available to you today. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. What? I'm just praying for you guys. I'm not pouting today, I'm just praying. 
And I'm not just praying that God would get me out of prison. I'm actually praying for you because I love you so much. And you know what's happened is everything I've been through and even where I'm chained up, I've got this supernatural joy because this is the way I live. I got joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, watch this, I'm confident. I'm not scared. You might be if you were in my place. I'm just not. I'm full of joy and I'm full of confidence. I'm confident of this, that he who has began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm not worried about my chains, I'm worried about you and I know you're feeling stuck in some things in life. Just don't, just don't give up, God's got you. I'm confident, I want you to be confident. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. I'm just, I'm just thankful for God's grace today, right where I'm at. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I want so badly to be with you, but I can't right now, but I'm just thankful for God's grace. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I'm just sitting here today thinking about you, praying about you, and I want you to get closer to God and know how much he loves you and understand it deeply in your soul. And I want you to know this, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I'm actually living with a whole lot of eternal purpose right now. I know it looks like I'm just stuck in a cave, chained to a guard. No, I got purpose in my life right now. What's happening is advancing the gospel. I got eternal purpose on my life right now. As a result of my chains, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. After everything I've been through, and after everything I'm going through, I'm gonna write a book to you, and I just wanna encourage you, because you're not gonna believe this, but right now I'm living with joy and confidence and truckloads of purpose. And I want you to experience the freedom I actually am experiencing right now. That's what he's saying. I want what he has. <laughs> I thought this week, I thought, man, if we could ask Paul, how? Because like, I have one bad day that doesn't even compare to that list of stuff you've been through, and I don't know if God loves me anymore. Right? I have one bad day or one bad week, and I'm ready to throw in the towel. And I definitely don't feel joy and confident and a bunch of purpose. How? I think he would tell us all kinds of things. But I think I, I found at least what I think are four things that I think he would say, Red Rocks Church, you gotta constantly remind yourself of these four things. And the first one is this. Red Rocks Church, your situation doesn't get to steal your confidence. It doesn't get to steal your purpose. It doesn't get to steal your joy. It doesn't get to steal your calling. Your situation doesn't get to steal your calling. You can choose to rise above your situation and continue to walk in your calling no matter where God has you, no matter how stuck you feel. Now, isn't it true that, that every single one of us, we, we come to these places in life where we just kind of, if we're honest, we go, I'm just not where I want to be. This isn't where I wanted to be at this stage of life. This isn't what I, what I wanted to be dealing with. This isn't what I wanted my, my kids to be dealing with. This isn't what I wanted my parents to be dealing with. This is not where I wanted to be financially at this point in life. Like, I didn't see this coming. This is not where I wanted to be professionally at this stage of the game. I wanted to be married and I'm not. I wanted to be married and I'm divorced. I wanted to have kids and we couldn't. We had kids and there's a bunch of struggles. The job isn't working out. My dreams aren't happening. Like there's all these things. This isn't what I wanna be dealing with. You ever feel that? And it's then that we find ourselves, at least me, getting real intro introspective. I just focus on me and my problems, and my calling rarely even enters my mind. I'm too busy having a pity party to walk in my calling. I just, I just get that way, and I bet you do too. Paul found this supernatural joy from actually walking in his calling while he was in the spot he didn't want to be in. That's the key. 
He said, my situation, it doesn't get to steal my calling. I get to decide that. I think he would say, Red Rock Church, you don't have to wait till your situation changes to experience the supernatural joy that comes with walking in your God-given calling. You can do it from wherever you're at. You can do it from a hospital room. You can do it from a correctional facility. You can do it from a job you don't like. You can do it from an unemployment line. You can do it from a school that you hate. You can, you can walk in your calling right where you're at. You don't have to wait. I think he would say, guys, I got this supernatural joy because I'm choosing to walk in my calling while I feel stuck. He said this in 1 Corinthians 7, don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. Listen to this. This is, this is great advice. Live and obey and love and believe right there. What if we did that? What if today, right where I'm at, Dealing with stuff I don't want to be dealing with. I went, that's okay. My situation doesn't get to steal my calling. I'm going to live right here. I'm going to obey right here. I'm going to love right here. I'm going to work right here. I'm going to reach people from right here. I'm going to love people from right here. My situation doesn't get to take my calling. <laughs> Paul just decided, I'm going to embrace where God has me and walk in my calling right where I am. We can do that. I saw a seven-year-old girl with leukemia do that maybe better than anyone I've ever seen. Depending on how long you've been at this church, you may remember a few years back, the youngest and best preacher this church has ever had on this stage was a seven-year-old girl with leukemia named Gabby. And when I met this girl at the hospital, like, I fell in love with her. And she told me about how she didn't want to be in the hospital, and she was in the hospital a lot. She said, it hurts when I'm at the hospital, and I get scared. And I got this port, and they just keep, and it hurts, and it scares me. And, and her mom said, but Sean, you should see her. She's turned this, this hospital room into an outreach center. Nobody on this floor, you can't work on this floor and not think about Jesus. She said she would tell every nurse and every doctor that came in, she, she'd grill them. She, nurse would come in, and she'd go, hey, you love Jesus? Hey, you know Jesus? She said one of the main doctors came in one day and Gabby looks at him and goes, you go to church? He goes, no. She goes, why not? She decided to turn her pain into a platform right where she was. And she said, I'm gonna live with some purpose no matter where I'm located right now in life. She would, she would tell people all around the hospital room, it's okay, don't be afraid. God's got us under control. God's got us in his hands. She would, she would pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. She was not going to let her situation keep her from walking in her calling. We can do that, church. And I think Paul would say, when you choose to live that way, there's joy and there's confidence and there's purpose and it's gonna blow you away. You can live life to the fullest and go through troubles at the same time. At, after each of these four points today, I have a prayer for you. Some of you need to screenshot one of these prayers. I have no um, false ideas that you're gonna remember all four points. What I've prayed is that God would speak to you about what you need to hear today. And when that happens and you see this prayer pop up there, take a screenshot, take it home with you and pray it this week and watch what happens. Prayer for point number one is this. God, you've got me here. Help me to embrace it and to find the purpose in it. This isn't where I wanna be, God. This isn't where I thought I'd be at this stage of the game, but I'm here. Would you help me? to embrace it and find some purpose in it because you got me here for a reason. I know that. Let's go live with some purpose. Amen? Amen? Second thing I think he'd remind us is this. It's what we've been talking about. There's purpose in the pain. Now, this one takes grit. This one is a gritty choice that you and I get to make. No one will force us. We don't have to. We get to make this choice. And the choice is this. I can either choose today to keep focusing on all my problems, or I can start to focus on the fact that God said he'll give purpose to my problems. He'll take what the enemy meant for evil and he'll turn it around and he'll use it for good. That's his promise. And I get to focus on either my problems or the fact that there might be some God-given purpose in the middle of my problems. It's a gritty choice, we can make it. It's one that we see him making. Let's reread 12 through 14. Watch him deciding to make this choice. You don't think he could sit there and write 
paragraph after paragraph about how bad the chains hurt and how where, where it's linked is one of the places where the whips pulled flesh off of his arm and it hurts so bad and the guard is so annoying and smells and I'm stuck. Like, you don't think he could write about all the problems? He says, no, I'm not focusing on that today. I'm making this gritty choice and I'm choosing to focus on the purpose. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. There's purpose in this. I can see it when I look for it. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Jesus. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I'm choosing to focus on the fact that God can use my pain for a purpose. I'm focusing on the fact that because I'm hurting, God can take my hurts and help me turn this around and help somebody else who's hurting down the road. And then he does something so crazy to me. He doesn't just focus on it. He actually looks for opportunities to make that a reality. He looks for opportunities to go, I'm gonna take my pain. I'm not gonna waste my pain. I'm gonna take my pain. I'm gonna add some purpose to it. Satan, you're not just gonna hit me and not get hit back. I was with my boxing coach yesterday, and he was, he was teaching me what he calls crackbacks. And he's like, uh-uh, they don't get to hit you without paying a price for that. You throw a left hook, I block it, and you get a two, straight in the jaw. You're gonna pay a price. You throw a punch at me, Satan, you're gonna pay a price. I'm gonna crack back. I'm gonna take the pain you try to inflict on me. I'm gonna add some purpose to it. And I'm gonna go help somebody. I'm gonna crack back. We see him doing this. I've been reading this over and over and over. I just caught it yesterday. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What's he saying to him? He's saying, hey, I know sometimes you feel stuck. And I know sometimes you get worried about like where your life's at. And I know sometimes you don't know what to do next. And you don't know what's, you know what's gonna happen next. And you get full of fear and worry and anxiety and depression. He says, I don't want you to deal with any of that stuff. Just, just keep remembering, keep holding on. God is with you. God is working. He's gonna finish what he started. He's gonna get you where he promised. He's gonna get, he put that dream in your heart for a reason. Don't you dare give up. He's with you. He's gonna get you there. He's gonna accomplish an eternal purpose through what you're going through. I know you feel stuck, but don't worry. Okay, think about this. This is what, this is what hit me yesterday. What's one of the biggest pains that he's feeling stuck in this prison chained to a Roman soldier. Every single day he deals with the pain of I'm stuck. I'm not where I want to be and it hurts my heart and it hurts my mind and it just weighs me down and it's painful to think I can't be in life where I want to be. I know what that pain looks like and feels like so I'm going to take this pain and now I'm going to go find some people that might be struggling with the same thing I'm going to take my pain and add some purpose to it and go I know what it feels to feel stuck. I'm with you. I've been there but God's given me grace through it. God's going to give you grace through it. I'm going to take my pain. I'm going to add some purpose to it and I'm going to go help somebody else with it. He's looking for opportunities to use his pain with a purpose. And I started thinking, well, what about us? Wait, wait let me read this verse first. This is what, this, he writes this later. This, 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 I read this yesterday and went, that's exactly what he's doing. That's exactly what's on his mind. Listen to this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can go tap into some of that God-given grit and add some purpose to our pain, and we can go comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I've been through some stuff, but God's got me through. So now I'm gonna go find some people who are going through some stuff, and I'm gonna remind them God will get you through. I'm gonna put some purpose on this pain. You're not gonna hit me, Satan, without getting hit back. You try to take me out, I'll use that very thing to build God's kingdom with it. What about you? Some of you know the pain of a broken relationship. You know the pain of betrayal. You know, the, you know the pain of things not working out when you wanted them to work out. Some of you know the pains of divorce. Some of you know the pains of being single when you wish you weren't. Some of you know the, 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 there's, there's a heartbreaking pain that comes into our life when relationships go bad. 
What if you didn't just focus on the pain, but what if you went, no, 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 I'm gonna look around my sphere of influence, I'm gonna look around my world, and I'm gonna find somebody who might be feeling that same pain, and I'm gonna go tell them, I know what that pain feels like, but God's gotten me this far, God's gonna get you through this, I'll help bear this burden with you, because I know what this feels like, I'm gonna put some purpose on my pain, and I'm gonna help somebody else with it. I know the pain of a crippling addiction. So what if you went and decided, I'm gonna go find one person who also knows what this pain is like. And I'm gonna tell them, look what God's brought me through. I'm gonna help you now get through it. I'm gonna put some pain on this purpose. I know the pain of not being able to have a child. And I see where you're at. So I wanna help you, right? We can do this. We can take our pain and decide, I'm gonna put some purpose on it. And I'm gonna go help somebody else. And Paul says, when you decide to do that, joy, confidence, purpose in ways you could never imagine. Prayer number two, God, I pray that you would put people and opportunities in my path that I can help because of the pain you've brought me through. Help me find the purpose in my pain. We can do that. Amen? Number three, Paul, what else you got for us? This is good, man. What else you got? I think he would stay, say this. I had to remind myself all the time, stay in the people business. When you're hurting, stay in the people business. Remember your calling? You're called to love and to serve and to help and to reach out to and invite and to pray for and to share your testimony with. And to, You're in the people business. That's your calling. And when you're hurting... Sometimes we forget that. We start to isolate ourselves. Paul would say, that's the last thing you could do. I, I bet you he would go, look, I did it. I did it for the first month I was in there, and it was killing me, and all I felt was down and depressed, and I decided, no, no, no more. Somebody get me a pen. I'm in the people business. I'm gonna write a letter today. Yeah, I'm hurting, and yeah, I'm in trouble, and yeah, I'm stuck, but I'm in the people business. I can't forget that. I challenge you to read Philippians this week. It won't even take you that long. And circle every time you see him doing something for, for someone else. I'm hurting, but I'm praying for you. I'm thanking God for you. I'm crying for you. I'm missing you. I'm, I'm encouraging you. I'm equipping you. I'm building up your faith. I'm ministering to you. I'm writing to you. I'm trying to help you get closer to God. This whole book is about I'm trying to help you, and the supernatural byproduct in his life is joy. I think you would say, guys, stay in the people business. Don't isolate yourself when you're hurting. Remind yourself every single day, yeah, I'm hurting, so you know what? I gotta go help somebody. Oh, man, I'm struggling. Life is really hard for me right now, so who can I go love on? Who can I go reach out to? I'm in the people business. That's what I'm called to be. This is God's promise, and Paul was experiencing it. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. God says, I know, my son told you, you're gonna have troubles in this life, but remember you have a calling that includes people, and when you remember that and you act on that, you can still live life to the fullest, even in times of trouble. Stay in the people business. Here's the prayer. This is a gritty one. God, I'm really hurting right now, so who can I help? That's a gritty prayer right there. God, I'm really struggling. So who can I serve? If you start praying that and start looking for opportunities to do that, watch joy start coming into your life. Watch confidence start coming into your life. Watch purpose start flooding your life. And anxiety and depression and fear and worry start leaving as, the, as you are given these supernatural gifts from God because you just decide, I'm gonna stay in the people business even when I'm hurting. Yeah. We can do that, church. Number four, never underestimate what I have to offer. I think Paul would say, man, I had to keep, I had to keep reminding myself, never underestimate what I have to offer. Because I guarantee he would say, you wanna talk about feeling like you have nothing to offer. I've been beaten half to death more times than I know what to do with, and now I'm locked up in a prison chained to a Roman guard. What do I have to offer anybody? What am I gonna do to help somebody? Look at my life, look at my situation, look at my troubles. I just don't have what it takes. I don't have anything worthwhile to offer anybody. How easy would it have been to feel that way? 
But I picture him in there one day and the light switch just came on and he went, no, I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher. I reach out, I help lost people, I build the church, I show people the love of Christ. Yeah, I got one arm chained up, but I got one free hand, give me a pin. I'm gonna stay in the people business and I'm gonna go reach some lost people. I can do this. I have something worthwhile to offer. Yeah, I can't, I can't talk to you in person. I can't hug you, I can't lay my hands on you and pray for healing. I can't come encourage you at church this weekend, but I, I, I can write a letter. I don't know if it'll get to you, but I can try. I'm just not gonna underestimate what I have. I'm not gonna underestimate the way God has gifted me. I'm not gonna underestimate the talents God has gifted me. Would you guys put up uh, Romans 12? We have different gifts. We know this, but sometimes we need to be reminded of this. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, well then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If, if it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We got different gifts. Two mistakes that I make, I'm not even gonna indict you. Two mistakes that I make. Number one, I look around at everybody else's gifts and I start to feel inadequate. We do that, don't we? We compare our gifts with each other and we go, man, that, that's a real gift. Every time I watch Doug speak, I go, that's a preacher. That's eloquence. I don't have that. Every time I get online, and, and scroll through some of the pastors I follow, I go, man, that's, I could never, I just don't. We all do it. The irony is, I've actually sat with people before where I went, man, I've, I felt so insecure being around you because you're so good at this, and they've went, oh my gosh, that's so funny because I felt so insecure being around you because you're, it's true. A lot of the people you're looking at going, I wish I could be like them, they're looking at you going, I wish I could be like them. We compare our gifts and we, minimal, we minimize what we could do we often overestimate what we could do with what we don't have, and we underestimate what we could do with what we do have. We just do that on autopilot. We gotta be careful. I think Paul would say, stop it. Stop undervaluing how God wired you. He wired you the way he wired you. He made you the way he made you for a reason. Go use that with some God-given purpose. Joy and confidence and purpose will start flooding into your life. We compare it. And then what I tend to do, and I bet some of you do too, is, and then life gets really hard, and I've already compared and decided my gifts just aren't as good as somebody else's, and now I'm really going through a tough time myself, so I'm not even gonna try, because what do I really have to offer anybody anyways? And look how broken my life is right now, and look how defective my life is right now. What do I possibly have to offer? And the truth is, you've been given these God-given gifts to show people the love of God and to build his kingdom and to make heaven more crowded and the whole thing, but we hold on to them because what's, what's my gift worth? You know what I mean? Paul decides, now I'm gonna use it. I don't know if anyone will get this letter, but I got a free hand and a pen and the ability to preach. So I'm gonna do it through a letter. He never would have known this what we know now. From that prison, he wrote four books of the Bible and has helped billions of people over 2,000 years. He didn't even know if anyone would ever see the letter. He didn't know if it would ever make a difference. He probably thought, I don't have much to offer right now. He changed the world with one hand and one pen in a situation where most of us would throw in the towel and say, I got nothing, right? I wanna finish by telling a story. My wife at first asked me not to tell the story because it's about her. And I was like, but babe, please. <laughs> my, my whole life is about coming up with sermon illustrations. And I was like, babe, this is too good. And she's like, no, I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging. I'm like, you're not, I'm telling the story. She's like, I know, but you always tell people things and you make me sound better than I am. I'm like, no, I don't. Everyone who knows you is like, yep, mm-hmm. Annoyingly good, I know. Recently we were talking about our own insecurities and our own gifts and what we think we don't have. And I don't remember exactly how she said it, but she was like, I just don't feel like I have many 
things to offer people. She goes, she goes, all I have is being nice. She's like, that's all I have. It's not true, but it's how she felt in the moment. Not too long ago, she was going through a, sorry, she was going through a hard time. Her husband got a not so great diagnosis. Her dad got diagnosed with cancer. There's all these things going on and she was struggling. And I walked out of our bedroom one day and, and there's, this, there's this dresser thing in the hallway right now and there's all these presents on it. And my love language is gift giving, which means it's also gift getting. <laughs> so I saw the presents, my eyes lit up. I was like, oh, she loves me. I said, babe, you shouldn't have. She goes, I didn't. They're not for you. She said, I have a friend who uh, is waiting on some medical news. And this particular friend, her mom has passed away. And I know that she would love nothing more than to be able to process these next 10 days with her mom because she wasn't gonna get the news for 10 days. So she said, I bought 10 presents and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take her one every day for the next 10 days. And I'm just gonna remind her that I'm with her, that I love her, that I'm believing for her. She would send her verses throughout those 10 days. And I remember watching that going, I wish I had gifts like that. She's changing the world. You don't think that person felt the love of Jesus? But to her, she would go, all I have is being nice. Don't ever underestimate the way God has wired you. He wired you for a reason. Start accepting the way you've been wired, celebrating the way you've been wired, and going, God, I'm gonna use the way you've built me to go bless somebody else and go change the world. Here's the last prayer. God, help me to embrace how you've made me and to use my gifts for an eternal purpose. Help me to embrace how you made me, celebrate how you made me, get excited about how you made me, and use those gifts to go change the world, even when I'm struggling. I think Paul would tell us, church, Here's what I had to remind myself, and here's what you're gonna have to remind yourself. My situation doesn't get to steal my calling. There's purpose in this pain. Stay in the people business no matter how bad things get, and never underestimate what I have to offer. And I think he would say, Red Rocks, you do these things even in the middle of your darkest days. You can find joy and confidence and purpose and go change the world. And it changes you in the process. Would you stand up with me? I wanna pray for you. God, I thank you so much that you're with us. I thank you that you're paying attention and that you care even on the days when we don't feel it and don't understand it. Remind us today that you're with us and you're working and you have a really good life for us even when all we feel is trouble. And help us to, to tap into that God-given grit and stay on course with our calling even when life gets hard and experience that joy and that confidence and that purpose that you have for us. With everyone's eyes closed at every location, I wanna ask two questions. The first one is this. You say, man, I, me or somebody I love, we're struggling. And today my prayer is, God, help me find the purpose in what I'm going through. If that's you, raise your hand right now. I'm just gonna agree with you in prayer that God would do just that. Yeah, we're going through a hard time. God, help me find the purpose in it. Yeah, a bunch of us. And the second question is this, you don't have a relationship with God yet. And you're going, man, everything you've been talking about today, I need, I'm missing out on. I gotta take the first step. I can feel God's calling me right now to take the first step, which is, which is just to say, forgive me of my sins. 
I wanna say yes to you. I wanna take you up on this free gift of grace called salvation. I wanna live with your spirit inside of me and I wanna go to heaven forever. I wanna take the first step and I know that this is my moment right now today. If that's you, right now at every location, put your hand up. I'm gonna ask God to forgive me of my sins. I say yes to Jesus today. Praise God, keep them up, praise God, amen. God behind bars, Brussels, keep them up. God, I thank you for what you're doing right now. I thank you for the way you're speaking to us right now about our situation and what could be our situation. I pray for supernatural peace and joy and confidence and a newfound sense of purpose in every single person who would say, today I'm struggling. God, give us the, the willingness to tap into that God-given grit and to decide to stay on course with our calling, even when life gets hard. And God, I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now, literally around the world, as people are saying yes to you for the first time. For those of you who did, as we begin to worship you with music, I pray that you would just make yourself so real to them in such an authentic way right now. And I thank you for the, for the life change that you have in store for every single one of us in Jesus' name. And everybody at every location said, Amen. Let's worship. <laughs>